It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Lucy Green uh, to give the seventh, uh, second talk of the uh, 2015 convention. Uh, Lucy's uh, Royal Society uh, Research uh, University Research Fellow at uh, Mullard Space Science Laboratory um, the depths of Deep South of University College London. And Lucy's interests are the sun, the sun's atmosphere, in particular the magnetic effects which you ultimately can lead to uh, coronal mass ejections which uh, potentially are rather important for us uh, here on the Earth. Now, Lucy also is uh, very, uh, has a huge interest in um, uh, public outreach and uh, science education. And she's no stranger to us as appearing on TV in, in numerous guises and numerous things in terms of Sky at Night and, uh, and Stargazing Live. And a brilliant job last week in Eclipse Live. Yeah, cool. <laughs> that was great. So good job on that. Uh, of course, for the SPA, Lucy is also our chief stargazer uh, for the Young Stargazer program, which is very important for us in terms of engendering the next generation in terms of astronomers, amateur astronomers, and careers in, in science and technology. And so, great pleasure to uh, have Lucy give us a talk on uh, essentially uh, one of the upcoming ESA space missions, a rather exciting, challenging, tremendously challenging uh, mission which is Solar Orbiter, and here we have Europe's Journey to the Sun. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I have to say, it is a pleasure to be here today. And um, just a show of hands, who did see the solar eclipse last week? Did you have this guys? <laughs> ah, that's oh, one of the news. <laughs> I've heard mostly from people who were, oh, I was in London, it was completely clouded up, and I really felt bored and after all the excitement that had been building across the country. So I'm really glad that you got to share that. So, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and it's also a great honour to be SPA's chief stargazer as well, something I took on last year, but it's something very close to my heart encouraging younger people to get into science, uh, maths and engineering, especially through an interest in astrophysics. So what I want to do this morning is, is sort of give you um, an overview of what the sun is very quickly as a star, what the layers in the atmosphere are, why we're interested in them, but then coming on to what are the questions that we want to answer in solar physics at the moment, and then why do we need this solar orbiter mission? So Solar Orbiter is a European Space Agency mission. It is being built at the moment. It's due to be launched in 2018. But we've been working on it for many, 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 many years. And I think for me, we first started working on it 10 years ago. But actually the ideas go back much, much further than that. So it takes a long time to get the community together, to get, to get your thoughts together, your scientific motivation together. And then you've got to design, build, test and launch the thing. And as you'll see, Solar Orbiter actually takes um, what I'm going to show you several years to get into the right orbit. So I think first of all maybe a few words about myself. So Ian's already mentioned that I work at UCL in a department that we call the Mullard Space Science Laboratory. I always like to show a picture of where I work because when you think of space lab you think okay you know high tech cutting edge but actually the, the place I work looks like this. Um, it's a Victorian mansion in the Surrey Hills and actually being here today doesn't feel too dissimilar. <laughs> so this is a building that was purchased by um, a donation for the Mullard company back in the 1960s and UCL's early rocket science group moved in in 1967. I should say that UCL was the first university to be doing space science in the country. We had the first rocket launch in 1957, the first year that Sputnik went up, but it very, very rapidly became a national um, collaboration with lots of universities involved and lots of um, engineering departments as well. So our history sort of starts with people like this, um, mostly men, that's not the case today though at all, um, men in white coats, that's definitely not the case today, I don't wear white coats at all. So this is a picture of two chaps working on the nose cone of a Skylark rocket, which was the bread and butter of the British Space Program for many years. And lots of my colleagues cut their teeth designing instruments and carrying out research on these kind of um, short rocket launches. They just went up, observed for a few moments, and then came back down again. But we've moved on in the decades, and now we're more involved in missions like this. So this is an um, Ariane launch. So we go from a rocket that's maybe 8 metres tall to a rocket that's maybe 80 metres tall satellites into orbit around the Earth and um, satellites in other parts of the solar system as well. So I want to say a few words about why we need space, but first of all starting with how the Sun looks from the Earth. And I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with these kind of images. 
This is the sun in visible light. It's the way we see the sun from the ground. So if you were to go out, have your specialist filter, or project an image of the sun, this is what you would see. Basically a planet disk, but with these sunspots on the surface. My interest in these sunspots is that they are regions of very strong magnetic field on the surface of the sun. So the very strong magnetic field allows the, the gas to cool down, and it doesn't shine as brightly as the surrounding gas, and that's why it appears dark relative to the rest of the surface of the sun. But they still have a temperature of around 4,500 Kelvin, whereas the surrounding gas has a temperature of about 6,000. So just to give some context. But they are sources of very strong magnetic field that ultimately actually come from inside the sun. We can zoom in and have a look at these sunspots. We see a huge amount of detail. They are fantastic to look at. We're interested in what they look like, what their shapes are, how many appear. Do they have clear, dark centres? Some of them have this umbra around them, this finger-like structure, sort of like petals of the flower all, all the way around. And of course, these are very, very large structures. This one is probably um, not far off the size of the Earth itself. So when we're thinking about sunspots, oh yeah, I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they are large features, but they are sources of magnetic fields, and that's something that I'd like you to hold on to during my talk. Is that the sun is a magnetic star, and it has these sources of very strong magnetic field. In these sunspot regions, the magnetic field has a strength maybe I don't know a few thousands of times the strength of the Earth's own magnetic field at the polar regions. So early days of looking at sunspots was taking place in the early 1600s with the development of the telescopes and ever since we've been counting how many sunspots appear on the sun. So I can show you a nice graph and I've got time along the um, horizontal axis going from the early 1600s up to today and then the number of sunspots that appear at any one time on the y-axis. And if I let that plot run out, you'll see that the number of sunspots rises and falls and rises and falls. And that gave us this idea that the sun has a sunspot cycle, or indeed a magnetic cycle, that runs over roughly <coughs> 11 years. So from minimum back to minimum again takes roughly 11 years. You can see that it's not really that regular though. It has times when the number of sunspots disappears. We can come back and talk about that later on. So my, my sort of general feeling about this plot is that <coughs> It is hugely, hugely significant because it gives us a direct indication of how the sun has varied over the last 400 years. But out of a star that's four and a half thousand million years old, is this a representative snapshot? And also there are even issues around something as simple as counting the number of sunspots on the sun. How accurate was that in the 1700s, given that telescopes were different, science was different. So can we actually trust this data going back in time? And recently there's been a group put together to try and answer just that question. Because this is the way to study the sensitivity <coughs> and we base everything on it. We have to have this simple measurement absolutely spot on. And um, so we can look at the sun in visible light, we can look at the sunspots. These are just some really nice sunspot groups that I picked out. You see the dark centres and, and the lighter penumbra around them. But we can also um, look at the way the sun's surface is moving. And something that was discovered in the 1960s, 1970s, was that if you look at the surface of the sun, the physical surface of the sun, you see very regular patterns where the gas rises and falls roughly every five minutes. And I've got a video here to sort of try and show that. Um, this is hugely sped up. So one one oscillation up and down would take roughly five minutes and he could go like crazy all over the place. But it was a really significant discovery because what was eventually realised was that this rise and fall of the surface of the sun is being generated by sound waves inside the sun. So if you think back to classroom physics, sound waves are a, an expansion and a compression of the that they're travelling through. So when sound waves are moving through the sun, they make the gas expand and contract and expand and contract. And then if you see that at the surface, what you see is the gas is going up and down, up and down. So even though we can't hear these sound waves directly, we can see them. And then we can use that to reconstruct the sound waves. And what's been really valuable about that 
is that it turns out it allows us to probe what's happening inside the sun. So inside this gas that we can never hope to see directly, we can start to understand because of the <coughs> sound waves. So the sound waves move through the sun, they go down, they rise up, they come to the surface. And as they propagate through, they pick up information about the way the gases are moving on the inside, temperatures and densities as well. So you can, if you can look at the sound waves, do a huge amount of maths, then you can work back to find out what's happening inside the sun. And that was really important because it enabled us to start to really better understand why we have sunspots and why we have a sunspot cycle. So that's what I want to introduce to you now. So I'm going to go inside the sun now. <coughs> I'm going to zoom in. So this is looking at a layer around one third of the way into the sun. And what we have superimposed on that internal sphere are magnetic field lines. So the way we communicate magnetic fields or, or uh, discuss them is actually to use a technique that Michael Faraday um, came up with. So you draw lines to indicate the shapes and the strengths of the magnetic field. So it's how do we, how do we communicate a very abstract con concept of a magnetic field in a visual way. So what I've got here are field lines running through the sun. Okay, now you can't have an end to a magnetic field line, that's physically impossible. So what I'd like you to imagine is that when they come off the bottom of the screen, they, they dip down and then actually they curve and they connect back to the top of the sun. I think it's probably fair to say that we get focused on small areas of research. And so I don't care what that magnetic field is doing at great distances from the sun at the moment. I'm only worried about what's happening inside the sun. So I've got magnetic fields that run through the sun. But what we learned from this sound waves inside the sun is that not only is the sun spinning once every 27 days, but that it spins with a slightly different rate at different latitudes. And that, combined with a very special <coughs> situation where the sun, because it is a magnetic star, but also because it is made of an electrically charged gas, plasma, you end up with the magnetic field and the plasma being stuck together, they're frozen together. So if you move the plasma, you take the magnetic field with it. And the technique of using sound to probe inside the sun has led us to think that this is what's happening inside. That the gas flows, the plasma flows around the equator are more rapid than those at high latitudes. And so they take that magnetic field and they wrap it and they wrap it and they wrap it. And this is happening inside the sun, we think. We've never seen it directly, but we have good reason to think that this is happening. Now, if you do that enough, you see that you get two bands above and below the equator where the magnetic field is now more intense. So lots of field lines stacked up next to each other. If we keep running this, the idea is that you end up with regions of magnetic field. So I hope <laughs> magnetic field is sort of starting to become more of a sort of familiar concept. <coughs> regions of magnetic field that actually end up pushing out the plasma around them and they become buoyant. They become like magnetic balloons that pop up through to the surface of the sun. So if I run the movie more, you'll see it getting more and more wound up. And then you see these, these loops of magnetic field where they become buoyant and they rise up. So it's almost like someone's grabbed some of the magnetic field, pulled it up through into the surface of the sun. So you can imagine, um, I don't have a You can imagine that the actual surface of the sun, the photosphere, is further away than that orange sphere, and so those loops start to pop through. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Great. Thank you. So, so if you imagine that the surface of the sun is somewhere like <coughs> here. These loops of magnetic field intersect the surface, and you would get one sunspot here, or another sunspot here. <coughs> Sunspots pretty much always occur in pairs, or at least when they're forming anyway. So that explains an amplification of the magnetic field inside the sun that becomes buoyant, rises up, 
and burst through the surface, forming your sunspots. So you might imagine that this represents the peak of that 11-year sunspot cycle. The magnetic fields will wind up, wind up, wind up, bits are coming up, and then suddenly all sort of peaks um, in the maximum phase. But <laughs> the sun has this cycle, so it has to have a drop-off in the number of sunspots so that the cycle can start again. <laughs> so this is where one of the big questions comes in. How do you go from the maximum phase of the cycle of the sunspot <coughs> cycle with this very <coughs> crazy distorted magnetic field back to this starting point? That's the big question. I have no idea how that happens. If you ask a solar dynamo expert to come in and talk to you, they'll probably say they do have some good ideas. But I don't think we have a really good physical understanding yet. And maybe other stars can help us with this, I'm not sure. But for me, this is one of the big questions in solar physics. But what I want to say is that one of the ideas involves um, a different set of gas flows. Okay, so now I've got you thinking about a spinning sun. There's also a conveyor belt of plasma that goes to the poles of the sun as well. <laughs> There's lots of complex flows. And that seems to, though we need it, preferentially take... So if we imagine a sunspot here and a sunspot here, the thinking is that this magnetic field gets dragged up to the pole and this magnetic field gets dragged to the equator by those conveyor belt flows. So you can imagine that a loop which is, first of all, oriented horizontally becomes oriented vertically and starts to look more like this. So this goes up and this comes down and this whole thing swings around. I don't know. I'm not very convinced by that. But apparently they say that to be able to help answer that question, we need observations at very high latitudes to see if we can follow the magnetic field going all the way up to the poles. But at the moment, all of our spacecraft are based in one particular plane. So actually, this is a top-down view of some of our spacecraft that we use at the moment to study the sun. So I've ignored all of the other planets except for the sun and the Earth. So the sun in the centre and the Earth and then the Earth orbiting around the sun. So this is a top-down view of the solar system. And all of our spacecraft are in one particular plane. So at the moment, it's not possible to get high enough up and look at the poles of the sun. But the spacecraft we have here, so let me introduce you to some of them. This is SOHO, this is um, the European Space Agency and NASA mission that's been up for, oh, over 20 years now. It's launched in 1995. That's placed at a very special point in the solar system that we call the first Lagrange point. It's about one and a half million kilometers upstream of the Earth, orbiting a point where the gravitational pull of the sun is balanced by that of the Earth. So as the Earth goes around the sun, so does that point, and so does that spacecraft. So it's always giving us a view to the sun. Then we've got the Hinaday spacecraft and SDO, which are in Earth orbit, and two stereo spacecraft, which are in orbit around the sun. And in fact, they're crossing on the far side at the moment. And they'll be doing that over the summer. So we have several spacecraft. We can see all around the sun, but we can't yet see to the top and the bottom. But still, we need this view of the sun because we want to go beyond just looking at the sun in visible light and looking at the sun in wavelengths of light that don't make it through the Earth's atmosphere. So, for example, ultraviolet light. And if we use telescopes from space to look at the sun's ultraviolet light emission, we start to see this view transform into this view. So these images are taken at exactly the same time, just the wavelength of light that's different. And I'm so envious of the people who were there in the early space era who launched those first satellites above our atmosphere and, and had this transformation of, 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 of opinion of the sun. I mean, really, it was controversial to think that the sun had an atmosphere that emitted an ultraviolet light and also x-rays. There were some ideas that it might be the case, but we have to get above the Earth's atmosphere to really know for sure. And the reason that we have the sun shining in these very short wavelength, high energy um, bands is because the atmosphere is incredibly hot. I mentioned that the surface has a temperature of around 6,000 Kelvin. When you go up in height, the gas becomes heated to maybe one, two, three, or four million Kelvin, million degrees Celsius. 
So an incredibly <coughs> hot atmosphere that glows in ultraviolet and X-rays. <coughs> so I mentioned magnetic fields before. What, what are the magnetic fields doing in the atmosphere of the sun? Well, you might even be able to make out some of the shapes. So those loops that you saw in the cartoon are what we're looking out for. We know the magnetic fields um, join up between the sunspots. And just like if you had iron filings and you sprinkled them over your bar magnet, the iron filings would take on the shape of an arch. We expect to see that in the sun's atmosphere. In fact, we do see that in the sun's atmosphere because the gas, the plasma, is trapped in those magnetic fields. So, okay, we know that there's magnetic fields on the sun. This is a picture of the probably things we've done at school, maybe at home, looking at the shapes in the magnetic field from the North Pole to the South Pole. But on the sun, we have North Poles and South Poles with our sunspots. So then we can look at the shapes of the gases and we see the same thing. <coughs> we can watch them over time, so you can see these are plasma structures created by magnetic fields, they're dynamic, they evolve, nothing stays the same on the sun, it's what makes it so interesting. So as the number of sunspots is varying over that 11 year cycle, so too is this magnetic atmosphere that's coming from these sunspot regions. But I think some of my favourite things to talk about are the most dramatic forms of solar activity. Something called a coronal mass ejection, which kind of does what it says on the tin. It's an ejection of mass from the sun's corona, which is the sun's atmosphere. So the reason that I'm showing the sun at this particular time, this is an image taken in June 2011, is that at this time, one of the most spectacular eruptions happened. I think it's still my favourite. So if you've seen me talk before, you've probably seen me show this movie because I just love it so much. So I want you to look at this particular region down here. In visible light, we had sunspots. In ultraviolet light, we see the arches created by the presence of very strong magnetic fields. And if I zoom in, you can watch how this region changes with time. So, I mean, it's, it's so dramatic. This movie is sped up, um, it's running over, is it maybe an hour or two? But you see that suddenly, a region of the sun erupts up into its atmosphere. And in fact, this eruption is so massive, literally so massive, that a lot of the gas, the plasma, rains back down onto the surface of the sun. And you can see that there's a wave that goes out as this thing rapidly expands, it creates a shock wave that heads across the sun. It reconfigures the surrounding magnetic structures. You can see that the gas starts to get diverted, where it crashes down onto the sun's at, um, surface. It gets compressed and heated. There's all kinds of things happening. And this is what my research focuses on. This is what I'm interested in. Why do magnetic regions in the sun's atmosphere suddenly erupt in this way? And so we do a lot of work looking at what are the the shapes in the magnetic field, what are the forces on the magnetic field actually? So here I need to find a force that carries all this plasma up into the sun's atmosphere. And so we've been doing a lot of work observationally and modeling to understand what that magnetic field is doing. And it looks like what's happening is that the magnetic field is getting very twisted. And in that twisted structure, you have lots of upward forces. Um, so when they get to a critical point, it can just carry the whole um, structure up into the atmosphere of the sun. To give some context, these eruptions can carry oh, huge amounts of gas, same mass as Mount Everest, and they can travel out into the solar system with speeds of up to around, well, I think the fastest I've seen has been about 2,500 kilometers a second. So they are incredibly fast. And if one comes our way, they take between one and three days to get to us. And, and, and Ian mentioned this in the introduction to this talk, actually, that when they do arrive, they can interfere with the Earth's own magnetic field and cause what we call stormy space weather. So they interfere with the Earth's magnetic field. That sets up electric currents, which then ultimately drives the northern and southern light, but can also cause problems with our satellites, our electricity networks, communications, um, all kinds of effects on modern technology. So understanding these corona mass ejections is really, really important. But how do we look at them? Well, we can look at them remotely from our vantage point at the Earth. 
and see these kind of eruptions happening, or we can measure them directly when they get to the Earth and they wash over our satellites. But you've got 150 million kilometers between this thing happening and us finally being able to measure it in situ, we would say, as it washes over the spacecraft. We can measure what's the magnetic field doing, what, what are the particles doing. We can only get so much from these kind of observations looking at the sun. We want to get inside that structure and measure actually what it's doing. There was a really interesting case a few years ago where the sun <laughs> decided not to produce one corona mass ejection, but a whole series in quick succession. And I've got that movie to show you now. So this is actually from August 2010. And if you look carefully, you might be able to pick out that there was just one after another after another. So there was um, a couple that were launched from down here, one here, one goes up here, one goes up up here. <laughs> I mean, they're actually almost too quick to see. And what we also know is that from the stereo spacecraft, which are looking around the sun a bit further than we are, that those eruptions, it was like a chain reaction. One happened, and then another, and another, and another. And the chain reaction went all the way around the sun. And we had something like, oh gosh, what was it, six or seven corona mass ejections happening within about 24 hours. And this, to me, just shows how active and how dynamic the sun is. And again, these are magnetic eruptions coming from sunspot regions. Uh, the, one of the lovely things about the stereo spacecraft is that we can now, for the first time, watch these eruptions coming out towards the Earth. So if you remember that they've gone out, the stereo spacecraft are on a different part of their orbit around the sun than we are, and so they can look at the sun and the Earth from the side and allow us to see all of the space in between. So I want to show you how that view looks. So here I have a series of telescope images going from the sun here, coming out through the solar system, all the way to Venus, and then all the way to Earth. And if I run the video, what happens? So we see material coming our way, and here is a coronal mass ejection, blasts out through the solar system, reaches Venus, and then reaches the Earth. And just look how big that is compared to us. Absolutely vast. We're like this little pebble in this stream of magnetic field and electrically charged gas. And that material is always washing over us all the time. So here we're able to track out a corona mass ejection. We have maybe, well, the sun produces maybe around five eruptions every day at solar maximum, but maybe one every three or four days at solar minimum. So depending on where we are in the solar cycle, um, um, matters for how many corona mass ejections we have rushing over us. But of course they can go out in any direction. But as well as having these eruptions coming out from the sun, we also have something called the solar wind. And this is a more constant outflow from the sun. It's coming from the hot atmosphere, and in fact is so hot it's pushing out into the solar system. So the whole atmosphere of the sun is expanding out into space, creating something that we call the solar wind. So it carries electrically charged particles and magnetic field with it. <coughs> and I have a movie to show you of that solar wind as well. So here we have the sun that's off on the right hand side, the earth is off on the left. Again, this is a view taken by that stereo, one of the stereo spacecraft looking at the side of the sun. And if I run the movie, you can see the stars in the background, they're moving as the spacecraft swings around but you can just see this very faint flow of material coming out from the sun. And I really, when I first saw these images, I was so impressed because this, this wind is, has such a low density. It's really hard to see. So this is a real, you know, engineering marvel that they managed to build a telescope to be able to see this. And in fact, it was Birmingham University who built this telescope. It's flying now on the stereo spacecraft. So we have these eruptions coming out from the sun, and we have this wind coming out from the sun as well. And we can watch it in pictures like this, but we can measure it directly when it gets to the Earth. 
But one of the things we really want to know is the detailed physics of how this wind forms. I mean, okay, I said that it's a hot atmosphere, million degree, and it's expanding out into the solar system. But it, of course, it's not quite as straightforward as that. When we look at the solar wind, we see that there are fast streams and slow streams. It can be very organized in its flow, or it can be very variable in its flow. So we want to know what causes that variability. What's the origin of the solar wind? And um, I've got just a few slides to show you of some work of one of my colleagues, who I like, I like to talk about what she's done, because she had a very ambitious project, where she said, right, well, I know that gas, the gas of the sun is influenced by its magnetic fields. So maybe it's the magnetic field of the sun, close in, that's influencing if it's a fast stream or a slow stream. And she wanted to look at that. So she ran this project where she did the global magnetic field extrapolation, which is a very difficult thing to do. And I want to sort of build up and show you that. Um, so let's start with this, though. This is an X-ray image of the sun. So X-rays coming from that very hot atmosphere. We made measurements of the solar wind at the Earth. But what's happening at the sun. I mean, you can't look at this picture and know anything about the velocity of the, of the flows. That doesn't get revealed in an image. But what we can do is use a spectrometer that looks at the Doppler shift of light to find out what the speed of the gas is. And if we do that, we can use an instrument that looks at a very narrow part of the sun's atmosphere and make Doppler maps. So where the colour is blue, the gas is coming up towards you, and where the colour is red, it's going away. So that's what's being shown here. So this plot on the left-hand side is showing the velocity of the gases within this box. So blue, gas coming towards you here, red, gas falling away here, and then some gas that doesn't have a strong component along our line of sight. So exciting stuff. If you've got blue regions, you've got gas coming towards you, could that be the source of the solar wind? That was the question. But that gas needs to get out from the sun and propagate all the way to the Earth. And that's a hard thing to be able to confidently say that gas does indeed escape and reach us. So she started to do these magnetic models. And I want to show you now the uh, figures that she published in her paper. <laughs> I'm not sure I fully understand them, but let's see how we go, because I want to show you what it is that we actually do. So first of all, she came up with this plot. So this is showing that zoomed in region here. So we've got some sunspots that have strong magnetic fields and we've got the information <coughs> about plasma flow. So here she's got that region, here are the spots with the magnetic fields, here are the gas flows coming towards us, and here what she's done is made a model of the sun's magnetic field in that region. And this is a classic approach of a solar physicist only to consider a little bit of that magnetic field. There's 150 million kilometres between that region of the sun and us here. So let's try and build a bigger magnetic <coughs> model. So she did that, and they created something like this. So now you can see the size scale is building up. Here we've got the surface of the sun, and we've got the magnetic fields. And actually, this starts to look a bit like a chimney. <coughs> and since the magnetic field affects the gas, it constrains it, it influences its flow, this is sort of start to recognise, because I can imagine that the, that the gas flow can follow these magnetic fields and start to escape the sun. So it's a bit like a magnetic chimney. But that's not enough. We need to go to a bigger scale. So that's what she did. So she made something like this. <laughs> this okay. I'm going to attempt to say a few words about this, but if you want to see more, you can come and ask me afterwards. So in here, we have the sun, and what they've done is created a global magnetic field um, uh, extrapolation. So within their computers, they've gone, right, we know the physics of magnetic fields, we've got these observations of the sun, let's try and reconstruct what that global magnetic field looks like. So you've got lots of different bubbles that represent different magnetic structures, like having lots of different bar magnets all over the surface. And what she found was that, well, I'm not even sure if it shows actually well on here, at ah, this one here. So this structure here that looks like that magnetic chimney, she was able to say 
actually does come all the way out into the solar system. But she had to do the small scale, the medium, and the large scale to be able to find this magnetic chimney going out into the solar system. I mean, there was a huge amount of work, and she found one little escape route for the plasma. Everywhere else, the gas is trapped by these magnetic bubbles. It comes up into the bubble, it reaches the edge, and it can't escape. But here, there's a little region that can. So this is a really tough job to do, but it's important because the outflow of the solar wind really means something for the whole solar system. So we've, I've mentioned already that coronal mass ejections drive space weather at, work, at, at the Earth, but so too does the solar wind. But more than that, the solar wind is responsible for creating something that we call the heliosphere, which is a vast magnetic bubble surrounding all of the planets. NASA tries to visualize it like this, so we've got the sun in the center, the orbits of the planets shown, and then a huge cavity, which is the region of space that's filled by the solar wind. So here are the orbits of the planet, and here is the bubble. The solar wind flows out, but the solar system is moving from right to left, so it sort of creates a bit something like a windsock, perhaps. <coughs> And it's the solar winds that creates this environment. If the wind blows hard, this bubble will inflate. If it blows more softly, it will contract and come back in. And what's fantastic about this point in space science at the moment is that one of the Voyager spacecraft has reached the edge of this magnetic bubble, and so we know what it's like for the first time. So in 2012, Voyager 1 Pass through the edge, coming out of the left-hand side of this picture. And actually what it measured was that it's foamy at the edge of the solar system, made of these huge magnetic bubbles. So I throw this in as a curious discovery that we still want to be able to explain. But we have a massive gap. So we have one Voyager spacecraft at the edge, the second one approaching the edge, and then a dearth or a, an absence of um, measurements um, in between. So this heliosphere that's created and controlled by the sun and its solar wind is a fundamental part of the solar system. We want to know how it's formed, but that involves looking at the sun. So now, after I've set the scene of we want to understand the solar wind, coronal mass ejections, and the solar dynamo that creates the sunspots, what is it that Solar Orbiter can do to help us answer those questions? So first of all, I think the thing to say about Solar Orbiter is the route that it's going to take around the sun, what is it going to do? In this animation, we've got the sun at the center, and we've got the planets Venus and Earth. And if I run the movie, you'll see Solar Orbiter being launched, and you'll see it make gravitational-assisted um, maneuvers using Venus. Here we go, the slingshot effect. It changes its orbit, changes its velocity. Solar Orbiter comes back round again, catches up, with the Earth this time, gets another gravitational assist. So all the time, the orbit of Solar Orbiter is being altered, altered, altered. And you'll see that gradually over time, it gets put into an orbit that's very elliptical. And it takes about three and a half years for that to happen. So when we launch in 2018, it's going to be another three and a half years before we're getting to the orbit that we want it to be in for our science. But not only that, it's going to go into an orbit that's tilted with respect to the orbit of the planets around the sun. So now, we start to see it going to higher latitudes and lower latitudes so that it can look at the polar regions of the sun, which is exactly what we want to be able to investigate the solar dynamo. The orbit is going to take it close in, inside the orbit of Mercury, so that we can get those measurements of the solar wind very close to where it's formed on the sun, measurements of coronal mass ejections very close to where they're forming on the sun. So it's going to sit in all this material and measure what's flooding over it from a vantage point that we, well, we certainly haven't had imaging telescopes this close to the sun ever before. So it will be a first. And I'm pleased to say that Europe are the uh, group of nations who are making it. So this is the orbit of Solar Orbiter. 
In terms of what we'll actually see from the spacecraft for the first time, I have a simulation of, of what solar orbiter is going to be looking at. So here we have the sun, the sun's spinning, and you'll see that the sun's getting larger and smaller because of this very elliptical orbit that solar orbiter takes around the sun. So it comes in close to the Mercury and then goes out to the orbit of the Earth. It comes in and out, <coughs> in and out. It takes about 150 days to do that orbit. One of the really nice things is that when it's at closest approach to the sun, the sun will be rotating, so the orbit is coming in, but it will have its velocity matched to the rotation of the sun so that we will sit and hover over the sun effectively for several days at a time. So not only do we get a close-up view, but we get this continuous view that we never had before. But going close to the sun has its hazards, <laughs> as you might expect being one third of the distance, or it's between one third and one quarter, solar orbiter is exposed to about 13 times the radiation that we get here on the Earth. <coughs> or solar orbiter is going to get heated up. So on the sunward side, it will reach temperatures of around 600 degrees Celsius, and it will be constantly bombarded by the flow of the solar wind. It's a dangerous environment. So it has taken a huge amount of engineering, huge developments, to be able to keep solar orbiters safe and keep our interests safe as well. And what you can see on the movie here, on this animation, is the, the heat shield going onto the front of solar orbiter. So the heat comes onto the front, and then you have to have a material that can effectively radiate that heat away and keep um, the spacecraft at the right temperature. So we want our instruments to be functioning well. <coughs> at temperatures that we would be able to function at. We don't want them to be too hot, we don't want them to be too cold. So at the front of the spacecraft, we'll have temperatures around 600 degrees Celsius, but then the far side of the spacecraft, of course, is exposed to the cold um, vacuum of space. So huge temperature differences across the spacecraft there. So to be able to deal with these temperatures, um, I was finding out recently that a new material has been developed and that's been um, a project that Airbus and Defence and Space have been working on. So whilst departments like myself are providing instrumentation to go on the spacecraft, it's Airbus, Defence and Space who are actually building the spacecraft itself. And they released some images of the heat shield um, very recently. So you may have seen it on the news. They had images like this come out. So this is showing one of the models of Solar Orbiter. It's called the Structural Thermal Model. So this won't be the actual spacecraft that's launched, but just one of the many that um, one of the models that get built to be able to test and make sure that um, it's going to be able to survive in the extreme conditions in space. So you see the heat shield here. These are where the telescopes that look at the sun will be poking through, and they apparently have used a material that, well, the way that they said it was a material that used to be used in cave paintings. That was bone charcoal that gives them just the right thermal properties. It doesn't evaporate off and provide particles that will damage the spacecraft. It transports the heat effectively. And they call it solar black. So they created, or modernized perhaps, a new material to be able to protect solar orbiter from these extreme conditions. What's going to be carried on board is a long list of instruments. And I like this list. So there's 10 different instruments up here. But what I've also put on are the countries involved. So, okay, can make this one, this one, this one. <laughs> Britain has the major involvement in solar orbiter. And in fact, um, SWA is an instrument that will be sensing the solar wind as it flows over it, measuring what it's made of, is it electrons, protons, what energies do those particles have? And that instrument's being led by Chris Owen, who works in my department at MSSL. There's a magnetometer which measures the magnetic field of the solar wind directly around the spacecraft. And that's an instrument being led by Tim at um, Imperial College London. We have a spectrometer which will allow us to make velocity measurements of the gas looking at the sun. That's an instrument being led by Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And um, this one is slightly more, this needs to be updated. But then we also have an involvement in this one here, the extreme ultraviolet imager. So my department's also providing electronics for that instrument too. And that's the one that I work most closely on. To give you an idea of where these different instruments are, I've got a couple of images. So this one here.
here shows the location of the images that will be, uh, sorry, the instruments that will be looking at the sun. So here we have the extreme ultraviolet imager looking at the sun, taking those images. This is the spectrometer. Uh, this is another instrument that enables us to block out the sun, actually, and look at the gas moving in between. So we've got several what we call remote sensing instruments. Then we have the in-situ instruments, so the measuring, sniffing, and tasting the solar wind around it. So this is where the solar wind analyzer, we have one sensor here, one sensor here. You can see the solar panels, this is the body of the spacecraft. But then there's also a long boom that comes out, and we've got another one of our sensors out on the end of the boom. So it is absolutely jam-packed with instruments that can make all kinds of measurements. And it is a very, very large and significant uh, European activity. So I think just to finish off with that, just a couple of images of the instruments that we're building. So I mentioned that we're lead on the solar wind analyzer. What does that look like? It's not the most photogenic thing in the world. <laughs> Here we have it. On the left, we've got a computer model, design model of the instruments. And then on the right, one of the sensors. So this thing is probably um, about the size of two bags of sugar. And the charged particles enter the instruments here and here. So you can see they come in from the side and they get directed in and then they get curved round um, down to the plates where the measurement is actually made. So this is a full 360 degree um, uh, measurement all the way around that sensor and particles come in and then land on the, um, on the detector. In terms of the extreme ultraviolet imager, the one I'm more, or more involved with, uh, it looks like this. So this is an engineering model again. You can see the front here with the different openings for our different um, telescopes within this one overall instrument. We have high resolution, full sun, partial sun images, just to make sure that we can deal with this varying size of the sun as we get closer and further away in its orbit. So I hope that in that very <laughs> broad talk that tried to address major questions in solar physics, wanting to understand <coughs> why coronal mass ejections happen, where does the solar wind come from, what's the solar dynamo doing, and then introducing solar orbiter as a way that we will be able to get more data, more measurements to help us answer those questions and probably raise a whole load of other questions as well. But it is really key to get close to the sun, to get that different perspective and different measurements. For me, solar water is like it is the missing link. So we can take images of the sun and we can measure what the sun sends our way at the Earth, but what's happening in between? Solar water will get very close to the sun and help us answer those questions. So I will leave you with this beautiful image and say thank you very much for listening. come from regions of strong magnetic field, they come from sunspot regions, and sunspot regions ultimately come from magnetic fields that are formed inside the sun. So that's the sort of tracking back to inside the sun. So they are looking to develop a technique where you use the sound waves to, to indicate that a magnetic field is about to emerge before you see it on the surface. So they're looking to see this structure coming up inside the sun and pick it up in the sound waves before you see it visually at the surface. So I think it's a really interesting approach. And it means that we would get more warning on when a coronal mass ejection would occur. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a really nice technique. So a, yeah. But, yeah, so in that um, Orbitus um, heat shield, you know the, the big materials actually made of Where did they find that? Gosh, that is a good question. So the material of the heat 
Shield. Now, they ended up working with, I think they identified the material themselves, but I don't know where, how that happened. But they did end up working with a company in Ireland to get the material to, um, to layer it onto the heat shield. So they have a special process where they sort of merge the materials together. It's not like painting, uh, coating it with paint, but actually bonding the particles in really, really well so that they can't then come off in the vacuum of space. They can't just uh, be lifted off in the vacuum of space. But I actually don't know. I <laughs> don't know where they got it from or exactly what led them to it. Yeah, I will find out. <laughs> So, okay, here and then I'll yeah. um, Has uh, Voyager actually now fully left uh, the helio? <coughs> there are a lot of um, news reports um, that it kind of has and hasn't left. I know, uh, as, as how much has this been redefined with this, the helio force? Yeah, so that was a, it was a real roller coaster to watch the story play out. Mm. When the first person to say that Voyager had left was an American journalist who'd been looking at the data, which I take to be a good sign of how engaged people are in space science. They were looking at the data, they were waiting for it to happen, and then he broke the news. And then it was later on that NASA said, OK, we've taken a, a bigger picture view, step back and analyse the data, and analyse more data, and we think it has left. But as I understand, there were a, perhaps a series of crossings. But I, and it is difficult, because the heliosphere and the edge of it isn't an immovable barrier. It will be doing this, depending on what the solar wind is doing. So the last I read, it had <coughs> left. But we're at solar maximum at the moment. Maybe strong gusts of wind have inflated it out again. I'm not sure. I don't know. Really. No, I, I would go with you on that one. It's a movable feast. <laughs> yeah. So I'll go there and then I'll go up. Yeah. How rare was the 1858 eruption? And what are the possibilities of it happening again? Yes, so this is the Carrington event, do you mean? So, that's right, 1859, actually, September 1859, there was what we would say, okay, well, let me start at the Earth. There was a very, very large geomagnetic storm, which is the shaking up of the Earth's magnetic field that drives space weather. And the cause of that was, um, well, in fact, it was several eruptions from the sun, several corona mass ejections that slammed into the Earth's magnetic field again and again and again, and distorted it and shook it up. And it is taken to be probably the, the worst case scenario of what the sun could do to us. In terms of whether it could happen again, yes, it could definitely happen again. Um, the thinking is that you might get an event like that once every 80 years. And in fact, we did have an event that was similar in size from the sun in uh, summer of 2012 but the corona mass ejections went off in a different direction. So the Earth was over here and they went off over here. But there was a series of fast, large corona mass ejections that ploughed out into the solar system. Had they hit the Earth, we probably would have had a modern day calendar event, which is what we're interested in because we want to make sure the electricity grid is protected, satellites are protected, and so on. Thank you. So I'll go there and then I'll, and then I'll come across yet. <laughs> Uh, solar panel protection and regulation due to varying intensities as the distance from the sun changes? They do. So the solar panels tilt so that when they're close to the sun, they're tilted away, and when they're far away, they're tilted towards. So they're always moving, that's right, so you don't get um, a big variation then in your, um, in your power generation. Yeah. Any special is protection? Oh, do you know, I don't know exactly what they're made of when they're protecting them. Because, yeah, you're right, we're that close into the sun, they're going to be at risk. But, yeah, I'm afraid I don't know. Thank you. Okay, yeah. How is the, um, the uh, sound waves on the sun detected? And what sort of frequency? Are they? Yeah, so you can detect them by um, using the, the Doppler shift effect, which is where the wavelength of light is moved because of the motion of the source. So the sort of anal analogy is an ambulance going past in the high pitch to low pitch sound, but the same thing happens with light. So when the gas is falling on the sun, the light gets shifted to a longer wavelength, and when it's rising, it gets shifted to a shorter wavelength. And we can pick that up. And well, that's not acoustic, is it? Sorry? It's not acoustic. No, so that's using light waves. Yeah, you're right. So there's this sort of 
yeah, complication that to understand the sound, we're using light to do it. So we, we're looking at the, the visible light coming from the sun at the surface in the photosphere, and we're looking at how that light is changing. I mean, the details are that you would look at a particular spectral line. So if you split all the light up, um, you can see spectral lines, features at particular wavelengths, and they move. So you'd be seeing them move like this, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And then it would take about five minutes for one backwards and forwards. Okay, so I've come across. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering whether the elliptical orbit is just the best that we could do, or is that kind of the optimum for the science? Ah, good question. The elliptical orbit isn't the best we can do, or optimum for the science. Ah, so, um, a huge amount of discussion has gone into that. So we want to get as close as possible, but the technology will only get us so f allow us to go so far. We're heavily based on Becky Colombo technology, so you don't have to re reinvent the wheel, because obviously that's expensive. And there's this playoff between where the other planets are to give you your gravitational assist. <coughs> when do you launch? So we've just had a delay announced in the launch, which changes everything. So they've just gone back, um, look, looked at the models again, looked at the trajectories. And so this is, I think this is the best, the orbit that they have is, is the best for getting the science done, getting there in the quickest time, being able to get the data back to Earth, all those things are factored in, but it is, I think, a sort of balancing game of tra trade-offs, but um, trying to find the optimum out of those. But it is hugely complex to figure out what your orbit should actually be. I've certainly looked at, I don't know, ten different orbit scenarios that people have shown me. So I, I'll go here, and then I'll go to the back of the here. Yeah. To me, so by to uh, 30 hertz to... 30 kilohertz. Is that the sort of frequency we're talking of? Um, you're looking at millihertz. In so, the, so it's got sound waves in it? Well, it's very low frequency sound waves. So you'd have to speed them up tens of thousands of times to bring them into a, the audible range. Um, so the one that I talked about on the surface is just one of a million different sound waves that bounce around inside the sun. They get trapped inside the sun. So are they compression waves as sound is? Yeah. Yeah, so there are these propagating um, compressions and rarefaction, compression expansion, compression expansion. So that's, that's what's propagating through the sun. Probably set up by all these gas motions bumping into each other, parcels bumping into each other, convective flows, triggering the sound waves. And then what you have within this cavity are what we call the resonant frequencies. So <coughs> lots of them get cancelled out, but then the ones that don't win out and they carry on going. And I think one way to think about it is a bit, is a bit like being a big organ pipe. That you know, The bigger the pipe, the lower the notes. And we've got a huge cavity there, 110 times as wide as the earth, and it has a really low note. Yeah. 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 Among the many superb videos you show, there are two. One of the coronal mass ejection coming towards the earth, and one of the uh, solar wind can one download the videos from anywhere? Yes, good question. You can. So lots of these are online. <coughs> if you do a search for stereo, NASA's stereo spacecraft, they have online galleries. But then because this instrument, okay, it was built by Birmingham University, but the, the, the main lead for it is the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. So they also have a website and they have movies available on there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier on you had the uh, a graph of the solar maximum. You also had a point which is uh, the solar, mi solar minimum, uh, the Monda minimum, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you correlate like, Monda, minim Monda minimums with like Earth weather? And how far back have you been able to go? If, if it has none, yeah. I know it's maybe a historical rather than... Yeah, so that's right. So there's this sort of idea that's out there that during that time between 1650 and 1715, when the sunspots disappeared, it had an effect on northern European weather. Yeah. And I think that's quite well believed, but it's winter weather, not summer weather. So there were some cold winters at that time, but there were some hot summers. And the sort of 
contemporary thought on that is that actually in the last solar minimum um, around here, uh, yeah, around here, we had a very prolonged uh, quiet time on the sun, and then we also had some cold northern European winters. And the thinking is that you need to be looking at the ultraviolet light that the sun gives off, which also tracks this solar cycle. So you have a lot at maximum, not very much at minimum. So you modulate the magnetic field, and that has a corresponding effect on the amount of ultraviolet light given off. And then the amount of ultraviolet light given off then impacts on our atmosphere because it gets absorbed by the atmosphere. That heats it, that drives wind patterns. And to cut a hugely complex story short that I really don't fully understand is that it's thought that the ultraviolet light output from the sun might affect the position of the jet stream, which then might affect northern European winters. So Joanna Haig at Imperial College does a lot of really good work on that, and Mike Lockwood at Reading University as well. But really early days. But I think there's some really interesting new approaches being There's also, I was interested in the gap of, what, mm. nearly 100 years. Yeah, I've yeah. No yeah. Solar, solar, uh, not much solar at all. Yeah. Is, that, is that cyclical that as well? Have you, have you oh, this gap here. Yeah. Um, it's happened before, we think. By using proxies for sunspot activity, you can go back several thousand years. And there have been other minimum, like grand minima, yeah. like this. Um, I don't know that they occur in a cyclic way, but they certainly have been ones before. So Mike Lockwood at Reading would argue that actually at the moment we're in what we call a grand maximum and the activity that we're watching at the moment isn't representative of the long term of summer. We're just at a particularly active phase at the moment. Yeah. Okay, I saw a hand go there. Yeah. In the uh, last time, I think it was over 100 years ago, we had a major solar episode. All the telegraph systems were knocked out around the world because we didn't even have telephones. We have not been back there. Has anyone yet come up with the mathematics to predict the cycles and when the next big event will come that will cause a trillion so, dollar disruption? So this is the Carrington event. This is the one that was also questioned about down here. So this yeah, this event in eighteen fifty nine that knocked out the telegraph systems um, was yeah, September in September eighteen fifty nine. So there's a lot of work looking at what might the consequences of such an event be again, and how frequently would they occur? But I, I don't know, I think, I mean, the national grid, I think it's fair to say, view these as random events, but then we like to think about patterns, and then we're thinking maybe 80 years, one every 80 years might be the likelihood. But it's, um, it's again, another moving beast, because we need to collect more data. We need data. You know, when I look at the sun and I see these coronal mass, mass ejections going off, how do I know if that would, they would be ones to cause a Carrington-like event? Mm. I've got to be sitting in the coronal mass ejection to measure it directly to get the information I need, which is how fast is it moving, what's the what's the um, <coughs> plasma density in it, and what's the magnetic field in it like. And at the moment, we have so few sampling points; it's almost impossible to say. I was just going to add on that, just as a, as a plug for the videos online for the SBA. Uh, Richard Harrison gave a talk uh, recently where he looked at the risk analysis in terms of what that effect would be on the national grid, etc., etc., etc. So that video is actually on the web uh, in, in Pop Astro if you want to have a look. So it just takes over right. from, uh, from where Lucy was and moves it into what the impact would be for satellites, etc., in terms of that. Could these not be correlated with ash cores? They could, yes, and that's a good point. So it is within ice cores, that's one of the ways to track back thousands of years. You can look at um, beryllium-10 and one of the carbon isotopes to get a proxy of the sunspot activity. So the sunspots create the magnetic field in the sun's atmosphere. When there's lots of sunspots, you get a strong, large field. When there's fewer, you get a smaller, weak field. And that, in turn, has an effect on high energy particles coming from the galaxy, so a strong field, they get deflected, and weak field, they come in and they reach the Earth. And that then is a signature that's laid down in the ice cores. Yeah. One or two final questions. I'll let you pick. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> the question was, do you think it's possible to have a net 
a net um, magnetic zero force on the surface of the sun at any particular time, and is that what your students model yeah. Ah, so. yes. So, yes, zero magnetic force. So we would call them um, null points, magnetic null points. And, yeah, absolutely, we think they exist. We have, we think they exist from the observations and the shapes of the gas that follow the magnetic field, and we think they exist from the modelling as well, the reconstructed magnetic field. And you could um, perhaps imagine, um, well, okay, this is sort of thing I need to draw somehow. Um, oh, well, actually, I've got a record. So that's the surface of the sun. Ian, the light from that point is by the curtain, left of the curtain. <coughs> yeah. No, 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 it's not the window. Of the window. Ah, I can see it. Is it this one here? Oh, that one. That one? That one? The one's tiny. Yeah. Ah, there you go. So, uh, so, this is like the photosphere. That's the photosphere. And I've got magnetic field coming from the interior into the atmosphere. I might have a sunspot here with a north magnetic pole, a sunspot here with a south magnetic pole, I call them plus and minus. Um, let's have balanced. Uh, So imagine you have two sunspot pairs next to each other. You could have one magnetic system, another magnetic system. But actually, if I connect up my negative to positive, I could have something going all the way across. So you know, in solar physics, we're always drawing field lines between positive and negative magnetic fields and connecting them up. And so in here, you might end up with a region where you've got no magnetic field at all, a null point. So in, in that case, if you've got no bounding force to hold plasma in, and is that the source of the injection? Ah, it can play a role, that is for sure, it can play a role. Um, so if I, if I energised part of this magnetic field, maybe by moving the sunspots around, it would start to inflate it, so it would get bigger. Yeah, and there'd be no magnetic force here to push back against that, so it would more freely rise. So they, these magnetic null points probably do play an important role. But they also are regions where um, magnetic reconnection can happen, which is another talk in itself. <laughs> I, was going ask, I was going to use my prerogative for asking the last question, which was, you know, I'm just an observational astronomer. And, and these clever theoreticians, they, every two years, Eric Priest solves magnetic reconnection. Every two years. And yet another two years, it's, it's another solution. How close are we to understanding yeah. magnetic reconnection and just um, what it does? So, yeah, I think that, you're right, things have changed so much. So reconnection is this process where you can break and rejoin magnetic fields. So in this setup, I would... Um, and it happens between oppositely directed magnetic fields most readily. So if I follow my arrows here on this one, this is directed downward, but this one's coming out of the positive, so it's directed upward. So you could have reconnection happening here, and it would break and rejoin these field lines, oops, so that I would end up like that. So it's a really useful process. And then this has a magnetic tension that brings it up, and the whole thing moves. Um, so, I think it's the, it's the real details of how that proceeds that I, I don't understand. And, you know, on a, on a general level, yes, but what are the electric currents doing? What are the particles doing? What are the details of the physics? I, I feel like it's an open ball game again. When I was first training, it felt like people said, said no, we really understand it, and now I feel like we don't at all. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank you.